The readings that Dr. Floor and I have assigned for week two provide an overview of the shape and context of the higher education landscape in the United States in 2016. Many of the items that you had the chance to reflect upon in the introductory lectures were examined in detail within the readings for this section of the course. For example, uh, the Harnish article on the top 10 policy challenges facing higher education was referred to in the PowerPoint where Harnish and his colleagues outlined those items according to the Association of State Colleges and Universities that are front and center uh, facing administrators during the 2016 academic year. That's a current year lens and a current year glimpse uh, of pressures that administrators are working through on their respective campuses. Pressures related to access, affordability, guns on campuses, et cetera. That introductory article then provides a lens for the other articles that were assigned. Uh, the SRAB piece to me was extremely insightful. Uh, the SRAB piece was the result of a special commission uh, that was called and brought together by SRAB to describe the future of community colleges in the South. As you work through that article, uh, note the reliance that it places upon the access mission. Note the reliance that it places upon community colleges to meet the economic development needs of regions. Note the sections uh, and the conversation around academic preparation. But note the change that is occurring within the community college sector um, in a completion-driven era in which community colleges are being asked to serve as the economic backbone and foundation of their service areas. That mission, those demands, are very different than the mission and demands that were focused on the community college sector in the 60s and the 70s, where you saw either distinct technical institutes or distinct gen ed transfer institutes. Now you're seeing the development of a fully comprehensive community college system that in terms of its public service expectations in many respects rivals the public service expectations of land-grant universities. The THEC master plan um, for me not only is extremely well done, but it provides a wealth of data that you can use on your campuses as you are preparing everything from grant applications to SAC submissions to framing conversations within faculty or staff senates around what does the state expect from my university. You can see the public policy calls within the THEC document, um, but you also can see the overarching focus that it places upon completion. Um, it is a fully comprehensive strategic master plan, but a strategic master plan that is aligned with the funding formula and the public policy paradigm that's moving forward under THEC's governance with respect to, to promise, et cetera. The IHEP article is a walk back in time. Um, the IHEP article, if you are reading, um, if, if you watch the video first, uh, I'll leave it up to you to determine whether you want to read IHEP first or last. I think it's powerful to read the IHEP article last. The Institute for Higher Education Policy at the time was led by Jamie Marisotis. Jamie is now the president of Lumina Foundation. I really enjoyed this article because it is a, a glimpse into a crystal ball. What did some of the nation's best policy thought leaders at the turn of the century see as the challenges facing the academy? Um, I think they were extremely prescient in their um, forecasting, and I enjoy reading that article. I've, I've read it on a couple of occasions. I try to read it at the start of every academic year, but because it, it allows me to see that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Heinz's article on state leadership outlines state systems, uh, the structures through which our institutions operate. Uh, and we've assigned that article uh, because it helps to provide a foundation and understanding for how systems of institutions operate. Um, the Berdahl article is extremely timely given the changes that are occurring in the state of Tennessee with the FOCUS Act. 
Um, anytime you have institutions coming together in a system, there are tensions across that system. Those tensions have been extremely evident in the Board of Regents system, one of the top 10 largest systems in the country, where one board is responsible for everything from Mountain City to Memphis, TCATs to law schools. Um, and how does one board hold those tensions together? With focus, you will see changes in governance structure whereby each of the universities will have their own local governing boards. So as you read the Bredahl article, place that article within context of the policy changes that are occurring within the state of Tennessee as a result of focus. And then the Griswold article uh, really examines uh, the policy interplay between tuition fees and the pressures that families were facing in the mid-1990s as a result of rising college costs. That article for me is a wonderful reminder that the issues around affordability are not new, but the issues around affordability are even more pronounced now that tuition and fees at our universities are $8,500, whereas in the 90s those tuition and fees were in the 2000s. Um, the thing that for me is interesting as I reflect upon the Griswold article is the significant investments that states have made in financial aid. So in the mid-1990s, Promise did not exist, the lottery scholarships did not exist, the TSAC aid program was not at its current level. Institutions are funded and supported through those financial aid programs which drive down the cost of college, but they do not change sticker shock. So if a parent sees a net price at $14,000 at a university or $9,000 at a community college, that net price may be enough to drive away a first-generation student. So some could argue, and this is a question that we'll pose in a discussion board, would states be better served to make in, later in the semester, not in this discussion board, but later, but would we be better served to follow a model of driving down the cost of college rather than putting all of these funds in the students' pocketbooks and allowing them to shop? Um, that's a question that we'll talk about um, in sections five of the course, uh, but it's a conversation that is being had in real time in North Carolina where North Carolina is changing um, the entry price points for three of the public universities within their state, calling it the North Carolina Promise, their play on words to the Tennessee Promise. So as you work through this section of the course, Dr. Flores and my intent was to provide a broad overview of policy issues, policy issues related to cost, policy issues related to governance, policy issues related to structure, policy issues related to current policy challenges, and prior policy challenges from uh, 1998, i.e. the IHEP article, a deep dive on the policy paradigm for the state of Tennessee, but then I think a really insightful article on community colleges in the South. Um, I will return to you in a subsequent podcast to talk some about the SRAB article with greater specificity. But with that, I will close uh, this section and look forward to uh, corresponding with you through discussion boards and thank you all for uh, the work that you're doing in the course to date and with that I'll bring it to an awkward close. Bye.